Hey guys, so today's video is going to be something of a tutorial where I talk about some of the tips and tricks I've picked up filming wedding videos over the years. Now, I've done about half a dozen, but I did one a week ago and I've just finished editing it. And I kind of want to put some of my thoughts on the process down in video form so that next time I'm asked to film a wedding video, I can perhaps come back to this video and remember some of the things that I've picked up. And also, I kind of want to share my knowledge with you guys because filming a wedding video is a bit of a beast in and of itself. It's not like filming other kinds of events. It's not like filming say corporate events where there is almost like a uniform in how the video is supposed to come across and it's not like filming sports uh, events where the sort of the procedure again is very very standard but weddings are a little bit diff uh, different and difficult they're different in the sense that no two weddings really are the same and each wedding has its own tone and its own pace and sort of you as a cameraman slash videographer kind of have to sort of understand the pace and be able to film and edit accordingly which can be kind of difficult um, and also as well because uh, of the nature of the wedding you have to get everything sort of you know you have to get all, pretty much the essential stuff on camera and you can't sort of redo it as well so you have to make sure that it goes right the first time which means that you sort of have to take extra care and, and be extra careful as well um, okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the equipment, the preparation, the filming and the editing and I'm going to talk about the sound as well quite a lot because I've actually found the sound to be one of the more difficult things when it comes to recording an uh, a wedding video and one which a lot of people often overlook as well. Now I'm going to try and keep this as brisk as possible but there's a lot to cover here so um, I'm, uh, it may be a little bit longer than, I, than I'm hoping. Okay, so anyway. Onto the equipment first. Now, the equipment um, is reasonably straightforward. You want at least two cameras. Uh, now, they don't necessarily have to be particularly fantastic cameras. Uh, this one here, which I used as my camera two, is a, uh, it's a Canon Liegra HFR 206. I picked this up for about 150 British pounds, which is about 250 American dollars. That was first hand with a whole bunch of warranty and stuff on it as well. So you might be able to get one of these type of cameras uh, significantly cheaper maybe if you go second hand or look for a model down. Now the problem with these kind of cameras, the big problem which I'll talk about tackling later is the sound. The sound on them is tinny and it's horrible and it picks up all kinds of other ambient stuff that you don't want picked up. So um, don't you you know don't buy these for its sound just buy it for its picture. This can record up to 50 frames per second although the final result will probably be in the region of 30 or maybe 25 frames per second. Um, and it can film 1080 HD as well, which is about as high as you're going to want to go. You might not even necessarily need to do HD at all if you prefer to keep things particularly simple. But it's nice to have that option there. It also comes with a whole bunch of lenses, but you won't really need them. What is useful, though, is to have one of these uh, rings that can go on it, one of these... Um things that guard it from from sort of the sun going directly into the lens uh, and it can actually end up messing up your shot it's just a nice thing to have it's not necessarily particularly essential um, and you'll want at least two of these make sure that the battery lasts long enough for the event this one here has an hour and a half the one that i'm actually recording this on has a battery life of about five hours make sure of course that your sd cards can can go the distance as well and make sure that you obviously set the um what you'll really want to do is get um, a solid quality SD card. You want to get like a named brand as well because cheap um, SD cards can sort of corrupt on you when you least want them to. Because again, you want to you want to have like if you're going to get quality out of all of this, the SD cards are, are, are certainly where you want to spend the money because again, you you don't want lost footage. That would just be an absolute nightmare. Um, so what you want you want at least you want at least two of these. Uh, you can actually now. When it comes to actually setting up the camera, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, you'll want to do this. You'll presumably want, uh, no, you'll presumably, you'll almost certainly want tripods. Now, if you're using small flip cameras like these, uh, then you can get away with having small, lightweight tripods like these, which are very in inexpensive as well. They're also very small. You can actually fit quite a few of them into a backpack. Um, so you might want to take a couple of these as well. Um, the camera, yeah, like I said, the camera that I'm actually recording this on, which is usually my main camera, uh, has a significantly longer battery life and is actually, you know, significantly better. But I actually managed to pick this up for about 150 quid, which is about 250 American dollars. But that that was second hand, and it was an absolute steal on eBay, uh, which I was very lucky to to get my hands on. Um, okay, so yeah, you want two, at least two of these kind of cameras, and then for a third camera, I would recommend perhaps having like one of these stills cameras. A Panasonic Lumix, I hear, are quite good, which look a bit like that. They can actually record up to 1080p as well. Their quality isn't perfect, and they're quite sort of dependent on the lighting, but 
uh, it's nice to have one of these cameras just in your pocket just to make sure that you can actually pick up any b-roll footage that uh, that you might not otherwise pick up if you didn't have a camera in your pocket sometimes it might be like the bride getting out of the car sometimes it might be the groom arriving sometimes it might just be something that you completely didn't anticipate for but it would actually be kind of fun if you actually did end up getting it on camera so it's nice to have just this as a bit of a backup if nothing else um Again, maybe like if you had a really good video camera on your phone as well, that might possibly suffice. You don't want to do any sort of lengthy footage uh, that way because, um, again, it's not likely to be on a stand. It's not likely to be particularly good quality. But like I say, if it's just for three seconds of B-roll, it's probably better to, to have it than not have it. Or at least, you know, and again, you don't necessarily have to use it at the end. Um, what you may want to do, and if you think you can, you know, sort of deal with it is actually have a third one of these which is again which is fine if you're willing to actually carry it around in your pocket which is again it's a nice lightweight camera and I really quite like these cameras because of their lightweightness and you actually get a reasonably good picture quality as well not only for the price as well because when you shoot a lot outdoors you do kind of want to be conscious of not taking out super expensive camera equipment that you're leaving on tripods unattended because again they might get broken walked into knocked or whatever so again um Looking for looking for brands that do good quality um, and good price as well is quite useful. Okay, so what I tend to do is I tend to put one camera right at the front, facing almost down the aisle, which is going to which is aimed at the bride's side. It's the bride's day, so you're going to want to focus the on the bride more than the groom. Again, you're going to want to obviously talk to the couple. Um, ahead of time, but you're going to want to point the um, the camera at the bride more than the groom. So you're going to kind of want to have two cameras and I'll put them on a diagram which I'll put up there and that's how you're going to want to set them up. Now um, when it comes to audio uh, you're going to want to get a separate sound recorder. I've heard a lot of people refer to things like wireless mics and all this kind of business. No. On a wedding day you want to keep it simple. Now the sound on these cameras is pretty abysmal but it's better than nothing and it's not bad for a backup as well. So what you want to do is you want to record these ca with these cameras on automatic as is um, really unless you're in a room that requires a particular um, this in a particular light you might need to adjust the, the white balance or if it's particularly dark you might want to adjust the exposure generally speaking the automatic is great on this if it doesn't you know if it doesn't work exactly you can always edit it out in post but generally speaking the automatic setting it's 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 fine on pretty much all cameras so just you know I wouldn't worry too much about that um, so when it comes to sound, what you want to do is you want to record your sound completely separately, completely separately of the video. That way, if the sound that you're recording gets buggered up for some reason or another, you do have the sound that comes out of either of your cameras. It's going to be pretty bad, but it's going to be better than losing your sound altogether. Whereas if you, your mi wireless mic messes up for one reason or another, and they do, or if the cable to your, you know, if, you, if you're using a cable to get a microphone close to the bride and groom, if that, for some reason, someone steps on that and that comes unplugged, and again, that happens so much more than you might imagine as well, um, and again, it's one more thing to worry about, uh, you've lost all of your audio, so, um, or you risk losing all of your audio, and it can be really quite not something that you want to happen. So what you want to do is you want to have at least one of these, if you're feeling super prepared, might be worth taking a second. This is a Tascam DR07 Mark II. The, um, my second one of these is a Handy H1. Now the Handy H1 I recommend to anyone who wants to record audio on a budget because the actual quality of sound for the price is fantastic. I picked mine up for about 40 quid uh, which is practically nothing and the actual quality you get on that is fantastic. It's the Handy H1. Now you can get a uh, higher end Handy models and I recommend uh, you perhaps go for those if you can afford them. But like I say, my Handy H1 is just my secondary audio recorder. This is the one that I actually ended up using. This cost me 130 quid. So this costs as much as perhaps a low-end camera. But, again, the audio quality you want to, you get out of this is, is worth it. And, um, and again, it's a separate. It records the audio as an MP3 or a WAV file on this device, completely independent of anything else. You can use it as a handheld microphone. What you can even do, and if, you're, if you've got the time... And, it's, and things are going particularly well, um, and I haven't done this, but I, I have been at occasions where it would be worth me doing this, is to actually get one of these things, plug in a clip-on mic, like a little lavalier mic that can clip onto your lapel, and put it on the groom. So you can put that in like the groom's inside pocket. But it works better with the Handy H1 because it's just a lighter device. And then just have the little lavalier up here, not too close to the mouth, 
and have uh, the volume setting on auto and then it can pick up the bride the registrar or the vicar or the priest or whoever's doing the ceremony and then you can pick up uh, the groom as well so you don't want it too close to the groom's mouth otherwise the groom's volume will be significantly higher than everyone else's but it's it's having a microphone in the middle of the ceremony and it's having it quite well obfuscated as well so if you have the ability to approach the groom and ask him to uh, to put on a uh, lavalier mic then obviously um, that might be something you want to go in for again it's worth talking these things through obviously don't assume everyone's going willing and and, and, and willing to participate in this. One of the things I've, I've learned as a cameraman is that most of the time, you pretty much have to be a ghost. You have to be out, you know, you can't be in anyone's way. You have to very much blend into the background. And and, and, and that applies particularly at weddings because they tend to be high stress events. So only do this if like the groom is standing around like 20 minutes before the ceremony is due to start or anything like that. Um, because it is, again, it's a good place to get a microphone. Failing that, and which again, I've you know, I've never put on the lavalier mic, you know, but again, it's something that I would possibly consider maybe next time, uh, is to actually just put this, pointing obviously at the ceremony, maybe obfuscated, just sort of out of the way somewhere, um, just so that it can pick up as close to the bride and groom as possible. You want it away from the crowd as possible. Um, ideally, you want it pointing away from the crowd, maybe sort of coming in at one of the sides or something. Uh, but again, you're kind of at the mercy of your surroundings here. So you kind of just want to have this vaguely out of the way and pointing at them. You're also going to want to invest in windshields, uh, just so that the, obviously the wind doesn't go into the microphone and then um, mess up your sound. Also, a nice little trick that I've, I've, I've picked up is that when you're putting one of these devices down on, say, a flat surface like a desk or, uh, or, or a you know, sort of bit of the architecture or whatever, uh, it's worth having a second windsock to go on the back so that it's not making any uh, direct contact with any of the surroundings because that, like, if, if this is actually touching the surroundings, um, it'll pick up every bit of sound that you don't want it to pick up, all the ambient sound, all the knocks, all the nudges. Um, and what you want to do is you want to sort of protect the, the microphone from that. So you want to put like a windsock on the front, a windsock on the uh, on the back as well, and then just put it in. It might look a little bit funny, but it will benefit the sound all in all. So that's pretty good. Like I say, this is a DR, uh, this is a DR07 Mark II. This is pretty good. And that Handy H1, if you're looking for something on a budget, but it's definitely worth investing in at least the Handy H1. One of the things that actually took me a surprisingly long time to learn is to actually uh, learn to use the auto leveler. Very important to learn learn how to use the auto leveler. The auto leveler um, effectively just it weighs up the volume um, for you. There's a whole bunch of reasons why you want to use the auto leveler. Uh, I always, I, I, up until quite recently, was doing it manually, and the problem with doing it manually is if you record at the same input volume. Uh, the round of applauses that inevitably happen will peak it and sound horrible, but a lot of the time as well, the uh, spoken audio will be a lot quieter than you expect, because obviously you don't want to risk peaking it too much, um, and that means that you have to artificially compress and boost the speech, and that will lower the quality in and of itself as well. So just let the microphone do the work for you. It'll have some kind of peak reduction so that it, it, it prevents the, the applause from um, peaking too much. You'll get a higher quality there. And again, it'll just be less work to do in, po uh, in pro post. So, uh, separate audio recorder. One, if, you're, if you've got them and you're feeling luxurious, pack two because you never know. Because if you are putting on a lavalier mic onto the groom, and I recommend doing it only onto the groom, the registrar obviously won't be in, you know, won't, won't want to have any part of that. Uh, the bride will have a dress that quite likely will ruffle and that's just terrible for sound. So the groom, who will most likely, presumably, be in a, in a regular old suit, um, you'll just clip it onto the lapel and it's, you, you're almost good to go. I wouldn't rely on that. Lapels can go, lapel mics can go wrong. Sometimes uh, the you know groom might be nervous and sort of readjust the suit and it might interfere with some audio or something like that, um, or it might get, something might happen basically. It's always good to have a backup. So if you've got a second, second audio recorder, it might be worth having it from a distance, you know, shotgun style. Because what you can't end up doing is constantly checking the groom's lavalier mic to make sure it's picking up you have to set it and you have to be happy with it so again having as many of these backup options as possible is quite good it might sound again a little excessive to have two or three cameras and then one or two audio recorders on top of that but again this is you have to get the you know you can't miss footage you can't redo a wedding because you messed up the video um editing or whatever so also um yeah like i say uh, tripods. You can pick a load of them up real, really quite cheaply. If you're using small flip cameras like that, then the weight is, is quite fine. If you're renting cameras that are a little bit bigger than this, obviously you'll probably want to 
rent a tripod in accordance with it. Um, these uh, these these audio recorders also fit onto um, tripod stands as well, so that might be something you want to uh, look into. When it comes to preparation for filming, I've covered a little bit of this already. There's a few things that you really want to do. Talk it through with the bride and groom first. That might that might seem a bit obvious, but again, it's worth doing, and also it's worth addressing some of the questions you might want to ask. Might be how um, obvious do you want the cameras to be? Uh, if you want the cameras to be, um, if they don't, sometimes they mind or don't mind whether or not the cameras are in plain sight. Sometimes they want them tucked out of the way. Sometimes they want them completely obfuscated. Sometimes they don't mind if they're just like right up in the face. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, also, when it comes to um, preparation for the day, talk to the registrar or whoever's doing the ceremony. There's a few reasons why you want to do this. The first is one of their reason is that they want to make sure that you know the legal um, ramifications and the legal business around filming a wedding because there is uh, a little bit of legal business that you have to be aware of. You can't actually film the couple signing the register. Um, now, depending on the ceremony, depends on where this signing actually takes place um, and whether or not it's an angle shot. Talk it through with the registrar. Um, sometimes they're happy to keep the cameras on as long as they're pointing away from the uh, the signing. Um, sometimes they actually just would rather you just turn them off altogether. You've always got to end up, you know, sort of obeying the wishes of the registrar. They're the ones that sort of make, not make the rules, but they're the ones that effectively the rules come back on at the end of the day. So, um, again, it's worth talking uh, through... Um, sort of as much as possible with the registrar obviously they're going to be busy on the day but they will want to talk to you anyway um the registrar that i filmed uh, that, I, that i was uh, talking to with uh, a week ago with the last wedding that i did was actually very helpful and actually knew filming uh, weddings particularly well that actually that they actually managed to help me set up the cameras in the most ideal places because they knew the venue uh, and this was in regards to the lighting and the where the bride was going to be and uh, and all that kind of stuff um, and the registrar was actually very quite savvy in the whole videography kind of thing because they actually they actually managed to set up the shots for me. So they actually managed to make sure that they were standing in the right place so that they weren't being obfuscated by uh, the direct lines of cameras. So as I uh, pointed out, I put one camera facing almost um, at the bride, um, but almost sort of facing down the aisle, as it were, and I'll show you on the, on the diagram, and uh, one almost uh, to the right of the door where the bride comes in, and again... Well, you're going to want to focus more on the bride than the groom. Obviously, it's a mutual kind of celebration. But with traditional weddings, it is the bride's day. And uh, and that's... So you are going to kind of want to focus more on that side. That's generally sort of how it goes. Again, something you might want to discuss with the um, the, the couple beforehand. But it's it's kind of like that unwritten rule, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the bride's day. So you kind of want to... If you're going to focus on more on one side than the other... Um, what you want to do is as well, you want to have both of the cameras kind of pointing towards the bride's side because that way, if, they're, if both of the cameras are on the same side, you're not going to catch each camera in the shots. You don't want to have a camera in the shot of another camera. That's just, it's not really particularly um, a good way of doing things. So if they're both on the same side of the room, they should be on the groom's side of the room facing on to the bride's side of the room, um, but also sort of almost up and down the aisle so that they capture the... Um, the ceremony itself um so that's um and obviously what you want to do is you want to make sure that the, your cameras are fully charged that's all common sense when it comes to sd cards um if you are going to splash out on any part of your equipment the sd cards are really um or the storage medium whatever storage medium you're using i'm assuming it's sd cards you'll want to buy uh, a named brand and you'll want to buy quality and you want to buy them obviously big enough to uh to to, to house all of the video on um don't buy the cheaper ones because sometimes they can corrupt on you when you least need it. You don't want to uh, find out the hard way uh, that you need to buy quality uh, SD cards. I also say that because uh, they're not particularly expensive to buy high quality SD cards as well. So there's that. Um, so yeah, like I say, uh, you want uh, two to three cameras. This will do for a third camera because it's it's good just to have it on your pocket. You can shoot from the hip. Uh, you'll absolutely positively want an audio recorder. It records it separately, all in one unit. Wireless microphones and all that fancy business, no. Because if your audio recorder does fail on you, if the batteries for some reason aren't fully charged or whatever, you do have the audio from the uh, the camera as well to fall back on. It's not going to be as good, but it's going to be better than nothing. So, um, and of course, tripods, you, you, you're just going to need tripods, aren't you? That's just uh, common sense. Uh, also, another thing to put in your bag, you may or may not need it, 
but this blue tack uh, type, type of stuff. Now, industry specific stuff actually is a lot like this, but it's black so that it doesn't actually mark your cameras. If you're renting, obviously you need to be wary of, of marking the cameras on this stuff. Since obviously I use my own equipment, I'm less fussy on it. But you never know when you need this stuff. Maybe it's to attach something where you think something might slip off or whatever. Um, and again, you don't need it in, in, in many cases, but it's one of those things just to pack just in case because it's good to to sometimes secure a camera if you feel some, something's wobbling or rattling or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's uh, basically the case. Um, yeah, and also, yeah, like I say, learn to love the auto options on both the camera and the audio. That's particularly important. It took me ages to work that out, and I was having trouble with compressing and normalizing peaking audio from the from the applause, and then leveling the voice of the bride and the groom for for numerous times. And it's it's possible to do it on manual, but you're just making a so much so much more work for yourself, so much more work for yourself. When effectively the auto leveler on this, the auto level on the Handy H1 is fine as well. It just it does the job for you. So um, it doesn't do the job for you. You still have to process it in post to a degree, but it it helps a lot. Um, it helps kind of anyway. Okay, so that's the equipment, and I've talked about pretty much. I've talked talked about the preparation. I can't think of anything else there. But generally speaking, you don't want to get in people's ways. If you are going to put a lavalier mic on the groom. For the, obviously you're going to want to ask before and you're going to want to make sure there's plenty of time to do it and you don't you know you want to be comfortable with your equipment as well uh, because you can't keep checking obviously use the auto leveler you're going to want to have to process it in post um more um and again use the lightest most like the handy h1 which is like the lightest audio recorder that i i know of that's that's fine because you can put it in an inside pocket and you don't even know it's there you can completely forget about it don't rely on the lavalier audio though have a backup plan for that either have a good mic on a camera or have uh, one of these um nearby um and again you're going to have to use your imagination or your wit to actually work out somewhere good to put this uh, obviously each layout of every building is different and the acoustics are different as well that's again a big problem you have to weigh up the acoustics and you're gonna have to uh, sort of manage you know the echo echoiness of the of the the hall, and they tend to be quite bad as well, which is why um, uh, you want to get this mic as close to the bride and groom as possible. Um, you know, if you can have it on a stand nearby to them and they don't mind, then like sort of go for that. If you can do it in a in a in a, in a reasonably um, tasteful way without it sort of being up in everyone's face. But again, when it comes to putting these things on mic stands and uh, and tripods and so forth, these actually fit on directly onto a tripod. Uh, you can end up just having a whole bunch of stuff on tripods and getting in everyone's way, and you, you want to be careful of that as well. So, like I say, it's a matter of of, of using a lot of judgment here um, and sort of knowing your options if nothing else. Having these things on a tripod is also quite good because again it, it puts some distance between this device and, and, and like the floor or whatever and, and other things that might nudge it and and, um, and sort of knocks that might might show up on the sound as well um, so yeah that's another possible reason why you might want to use a tripod but again keep it out of the way um, sort of know whether or not or know how obvious or obfuscated that the bride and groom and, and everyone else want it to be as well uh, sound is going to be the most difficult thing that you're going to have to deal with though so uh so so um so bear that in mind um but if you can get the sound down if you can get a good sound then then everything else will fit into place quite nicely um okay so uh when it comes to actually filming the event uh what you want to do and again i guess this goes back to the equipment Make sure you've got a good battery or spare batteries or whatever. Now, your bog standard camera like this will, will last for about an hour and a half, and that will get you through most ceremonies. It will get you through any ceremony that I've ever recorded. Uh, and it's, uh, and um, this camera here, this has a five-hour battery, so that's obviously that's, that, that tends to be fine as well. When it comes to filming, it's a matter of knowing what to film and how to film it and so forth. So... Uh, obviously you want to arrive at the venue as early as possible or as early as realistically possible give yourself plenty of time to pick up b-roll footage so footage of the venue uh, footage of perhaps guests wandering in or whatever um, footage of uh, just like uh, perhaps interesting angles of the uh, of the hall that the marriage is taking place in um, and you'll be surprised how much b-roll you can actually pick up before the events even started and it's good to do that um, and again it's worth doing that with perhaps camera two um, because then again you get good quality and you've got still got time to set it up before the the ceremony begins now 
What you really want to do when it comes to actually recording the ceremony itself, and I've recorded ceremonies that have lasted between uh, sort of 10 minutes to, to over half an hour. So again, it's not generally been a problem to record. Um, so, so if you've got a camera with an hour and a half of battery time, I would perhaps have some kind of strategy to either recharge that battery or take a spare battery for the camera. Batteries for the cameras aren't too expensive, but obviously just check to make sure they're working. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like the brand name battery for a camera. If you're using a cheaper, cheapo camera like this, um, what you can do is is you can buy a second battery that's maybe like a third third party brand just as a backup, just to make sure you check that it works. It's obviously not going to have the life and 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 uh, longevity of the uh, of, of a of a named brand uh, battery, but it might just get you through in a pinch. So like I say, uh, buy quality of obviously when you can afford it, but again, if you can't, then maybe a, a, a third party brand battery might do the, do the job. Like I say, this camera can record up to five hours, so um, so I'm, I'm generally okay for batteries. I've always got at least this camera, if no other camera. But I've never had a problem with battery, um, and, and sometimes you, you, you know it, it's possible to actually find a place just to charge up a battery or charge up a secondary camera or something like that as well. So um, there's that. Um, when it comes to the day, what you want to do is set all the, uh, you want to generally speaking, um, and this is a bit of a, a blanket statement, have the settings all on auto. Um, unless the hall is particularly dark or the lighting is particularly uh, obtuse, the auto functions will almost always work and they'll almost always adjust accordingly. Um, they'll adjust the white balance, they'll adjust the exposure, they'll, they'll adjust all the, all, the, all the necessary bits and pieces. But it's one less thing to worry about. Any time when the auto function doesn't necessarily cover everything, you can you can adjust this in editing. That's the thing. You can spend plenty of time editing, just as long as you actually pick up a reasonable quality, uh, reasonable quality footage as you're actually recording it. That's the thing that you actually really want to do at the day. Do on the day is just make sure it's recorded and make sure it's recorded reasonably, ex uh, you know, acceptably speaking. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be. Uh, in, in a way where you can actually fix any problems in post. So uh, with that in mind, when shooting things, it's always worth shooting wider than necessary. So it might look like you're more zoomed out than you need to be, but it's better to be more zoomed out than sort of too zoomed in, as it were. Especially when it comes to putting, um, say, camera one, which will generally be unattended, and it'll be focusing on the bride and the groom from near the point of view of the registrar. So it'll be the other side of the bride and groom than the the uh, the, the audience, the you know the family members and the attendees are on. Um, that'll be unattended. So you want to make sure that that's generally as wide as possible, and it's easily going to capture everyone in. Everyone in now. Obviously, if you talk things through with the bride and the groom on the day, and you talk things through with the registrar there's a good chance that they will make the um, the effort to actually be at least within the window. Um, obviously, uh, the majority of people there aren't going to be uh, in the business of, um, uh, of, uh, of, of being in cameras and stuff like that, but um, they will most likely, um, uh, in a lot of cases, they may actually just sort of make sure that they're in, in the window. So what, what these cameras are actually particularly good at is that they've actually got obviously the reversible window. So make sure that if the camera is set up in the corner of the room, um, that they that people can see themselves in the window so they can actually set themselves up. Um, so that just, you know, it's just an extra thing for, for other people to do. The filming itself by and large isn't too big of a deal. If you just keep all the cameras on, and try not to fiddle with them too much. It's gonna, it's gonna drive you mad. Trust me. You're gonna want to make sure everything's pointed just so. Um, generally speaking, like I say, shoot wide. Don't necessarily adjust mid shot because you never know what bit of footage that you might end up wanting to use. I've actually had to ditch some really good footage from a really good sort of camera angle simply because what was actually being said was something really good, but I was actually just adjusting the camera position at the time and it just looked too amateurish to actually include that in the final cut, which was a real, real shame. So. Um, what I um, so so what you want to do is just shoot shoot wide as possible and just leave it and keep it still, right? Um, again, this is where this secondary backup camera comes into play. If you think that your your current camera um, isn't capturing everything, or if there is perhaps a better angle, or you want to get something zoomed in, just pull out your pocket camera, zoom right in, and then you've got two shots. It's better to have two shots. Obviously, you're only going to ever ever end up using one in the final cut, but um, yeah, that's kind of like, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the strategy that, that, that I go with anyway. Now, when it comes to filming, what do you actually film? 
So, um, the big ones, of course, are the ceremony itself. The uh, Usually you have like the bride's father's speech, you have the uh, groom's speech, and then you have the best man's speech. Sometimes you have extra speeches, or sometimes you have less speeches, sometimes, um, I guess. Um, but whatever it is, you want to get those kind of speeches up, um, down. Um, this can actually kind of be a little bit difficult in how you put them together in post, so I'll talk about that later on. But... Um, with um but when it comes to yes yeah, so you've got the ceremony you've got the speeches and um then you want to get all the b-roll as possible now these are little things like getting the bride stepping out of the car if she's arriving or the bride arriving um and then just general sort of footage that you can kind of sort of cut away to or fade away to and then fade back to um is is what you kind of want to get as well get as much b-roll as possible i only ever end up using 10 percent of the b-roll that i end up picking but um but you you definitely uh want to get more than you you'll, you'll end up using just so that you have more of a choice if nothing else um just as a bit of a side note a bit of a tangent if you're wondering why what that noise is in the background it's just raining particularly heavily and i just just thought that, that might actually come out on a camera uh might come out quite poorly on camera so i just thought thought i'd let you know just uh, just as a side note when it comes to filming as well um, so, yeah, you f it's worth filming the ceremony, it's worth filming the speeches. Once the speeches are over, I tend to have a policy of turning the cameras off at that point. Might be worth having this in your pocket for the um, for their first dance, um, which tends to be like a couple of hours after the, after the speeches. Obviously, each wedding's its own, um, and you've got to adjust accordingly. Um, but generally speaking, once the speeches are over, uh, I put the cameras away because that's kind of like private party moments as well. Um, that's when people sort of start drinking and you don't want to get really any of that on camera. Uh, or at least I don't. Um, part of it's like I, I consider that maybe a little bit of an invasion of privacy when people people are maybe a little more vulnerable um, or, or, or sort of expressing themselves perhaps more privately, as it were. Um, it's It's, again, it's not good to have cameras about there it just gets a little bit overbearing and then it starts to infringe on other people's enjoyment of the event so um at that yeah like i said the speeches it's worth it's worth just closing off the cameras there obviously talk to the one groom if you want to get the last dance on it's generally not that in, uh, not that big a deal there's usually family uh taking photos and stuff there as well um sometimes it's a nice clip to close your video off on but it's it's not the most important thing um but yeah, like I say, it's it's just respectful to the occasion to actually turn your camera to, to 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 know when not to film as well as to know when to film. I know that it's it's kind of an impulse just to record, 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 record as much as possible, um, and then just deal with it later. But uh, but again, um, as a cameraman, I've learned that you really, in a lot of ways, have to be a bit of a ghost. You have to blend into the surroundings. You can't be up in people's faces. Um, so it's definitely worth. Um, just uh just sort of giving people a bit of space at that point like i say as well after people have been drinking you you, you don't you want them to sort of enjoy the event <laughs> and, and and putting cameras there just is a little bit overbearing so that's a bit that's it when it comes to filming um up in yeah up until the speeches record as much as, as you really can don't get in the business of putting cameras in everyone's faces bearing in mind of course it's the bride and the groom's day and the, ultimately the footage that you will end up using is of the bride of the groom obviously of the couple together and b-roll which is things like the outside people as crowds you know you don't um i've seen a lot of wedding videos try and film uh, s sort of interviews with individuals at the wedding i don't think that's a good idea i think that that works out particularly terribly i think it's cheesy it's corny and it's effectively the videographer trying to do more than what's really asked of them um the wedding should be a visual piece um and it should sort of uh, be a an honest representation of the um of the uh of the event so anyway i've talked about the the equipment that i that, that, that i use and the equipment that i recommend i've talked about the preparation of the wedding video and i've talked about um the filming of it and when and when not to film now i'm actually going to split this video into two parts um and i'm going to talk a little bit about um the editing and the post processing and a few additional thoughts on it so um that's about it for me today thank you very much for watching i'll see you in part two